Praise the Lord. Good to see uh, many of you coming back to the house of the Lord. And uh, last week, uh, we were told by the traffic warden that we have a good problem because the place is uh, jamming up again. <laughs> I think that's a good problem, isn't it? That means you guys are coming back to the church, and uh, not only you, but also the other ministry, Chinese and PM as well. So we want to praise God right, for him, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, what you call that for him, uh, preserving all of us uh, during uh, this season. And we are really want to give God all the praise and all the glory. So how are you doing this morning? Good? Yeah, that's not very convincing. How are you doing this morning? Wow, that's good, right. Now I want you to do something, right? I want you to get hold of anything that belongs to you, not belong to somebody else. You can think, uh, get something that belongs to you and then just uh, hold it up. Anything, anything. You want to carry up your wife also can, huh? if the only thing you can hold up. Okay, I see many of you hold up your phone, right? and I don't see many of you hold up your Bible, you know, why? Huh? Anyone and you bring a Bible to church? Yes, I see. Yes, yeah. Wow. Yeah, give them a, give them a, 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 a appreciation. <laughs> Encourage them. So the rest of you must also bring, uh, bring your Bible. Actually, that's not what I want to do today. <laughs> but whatever you're holding in your hand, I believe is something that you can use, isn't it? I, I hold up the Bible in my hand. It is something useful for me because it's a word of God. It's a word of life. It's my spiritual food. It's the sword of the Spirit. For many of you who hold up your handphone, it is functional. It's important to you. You use it not only every day, but every minute, every moment. Correct or not? Some of you may be holding up a pen, and the pen is important because you need the pen to write. Yes, whatever that we hold up, there is a function that can be used. So similarly, God has called us to serve Him, and He knows what we have and what we are capable of. What you have and what you are capable of. You have your phone and you know what your phone is capable of and what you are capable of in making good use of your phone. And God actually won't demand more than what we have or more than what we can do. There's a story that talk about Moses. I believe many of us know about Moses and how God one day called him. God called him and said, Moses, I want you to go back and take my people out of Egypt. For those of us who are familiar with the story of Moses, we knew that Moses actually grew up in the palace of Egypt, but because he was a Hebrew uh, a child, and he actually sided with the Israelites and killed one of the Egyptians, and as a result, he ran for his life. And for the next 40 years of his life, he was actually, you know, shepherding in the desert of Midian. So Moses by then was already 80 years old when God called him to go back to Egypt and take his people out. And of course, no Moses, as many of us always say, no lah, not me lah. God, you call the right person. God, are you sure this is what I can do? I really can't go back. You know, people are looking for me. They want to kill me, you know. And who am I? I, I am nothing now. I'm only a shepherd, you know, and taking care of all the sheep. There's nothing else I can do. And he needed confirmation from God. He said, moreover, God, if I'm going to go back and tell, the, tell my own people and say, hey, God has called me to take all of us out of Egypt, they may say that I'm crazy. Who are you, you know? I, you have not been here with us for the last 40 years and suddenly, you come back and say God call you, call you and appear to you. They say we don't, we won't believe you. They say how if they do not believe me? And so you know, Moses actually gave God many reasons, uh, and those reasons was valid. I wouldn't call it excuses then. They were valid reason why you know. And he needed some confirmation. He needed uh, 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 some assurance or perhaps some sign, uh, some concrete proof that God has indeed called him back to take his people out. All right. And so God actually wanted to call Moses and wanted to use him, and God wanted to assure Moses that he was in partnership with Moses. God wanted to tell Moses that I am actually in partnership with you. You don't have to be afraid because when you go back, you are not going alone. I am going to be with you. God wanted to empower Moses by letting him see his personal potential. God said, don't worry, Moses. I know that you are unsure. I know that you are afraid. I know that you are also reluctant. But don't worry, I'm going to help you and I want you to know that you have the potential. You have the potential as long as you are willing to surrender to me 
and I can use you to do greater things that you can even think or imagine. So now we come to the point where God has already assured Moses that you know he can actually go and lead the people. Yes, God even tell Moses his name. Moses said, God, if I'm going to tell them, they'll say, who is this God that appeared to you? Do you know his name or not? You know, and even that, God has assured Moses and answered Moses. But now, come to the final hurdle. Moses still wasn't sure. He said, okay, God, even if I can say all that you have asked me to say, but I am still not able to do it. Very familiar, right? Now, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 4. And then it tells us that Moses protested. Notice the word. Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. After all the assurances from God, Moses still wasn't sure, and the Bible says he protested again. And now God is going to show Moses some tangible sign. Not just by words. Most, God already told Moses, you know, by words what he ought to do. But now Moses wanted something that's more tangible. And God is going to show him something more tangible. And God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? And this is the title of my message this morning. What is that in your hand? That's why just now I asked you to hold up something. What is that in your hand? And Moses simply tell God that a shepherd stop. Okay, let's take a look, right? Can I have the slide on our message? The title of the message is, What is that in your hand? And one thing we know that when God asked Moses, What is that in your hand? And what did Moses say? A shepherd staff. A shepherd staff. And as far as God is concerned, that is enough. So I want us to know that first of all, God uses what we have and not what we don't have. God uses what we have and not what we don't have. To serve the Lord, we need to start from where we are and from what we have. Where you are, your status in life, whether you are a student now or whether you are working or whether you are a, 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 a CEO of a company or whether you are, you know, uh, your own bosses or whether now you are at the retirement age, it doesn't matter. It starts from where we are and start from what we have. And when Moses tells God that I have only a shepherd's staff, I want you to know that when God wants us to use what we have, we must not despise what we have. We must not despise what we have. A lot of time we despise the things that we have. Now take a look at Moses. Moses only had a shepherd's staff in him. Right? And God did not ask Moses and say, Hey Moses, I think this staff is a bit old. I know you pluck it off from a tree somewhere, uh, and you think that it's good enough for you to take care of the sheep, but it's not good enough for me. I want you to go back and choose something better. No. God did not ask Moses to go and choose something better, right? In fact, you know, God, to, as far as God is concerned, that shepherd staff is enough. Whatever Moses had, it was something very common. Not only, not only Moses have a shepherd staff, every shepherd has a shepherd staff. And that stuff, even though it's common, is very practical. It is meant to lead the sheep, to guide the sheep, to protect the sheep, and also to rescue the sheep. Simple as it is, right? And uh, it may not be well polished, it may be plucked off from branch somewhere, but yet it was good enough for a shepherd, right? And it was also something that Moses used to. It was something that he is comfortable in using. I'm sure many of us, we have something, maybe a tool that you like to use, maybe to the homemakers, your walk, you know, is very important to you. Uh, the ladder or whatever, or even the chopper that you put in your hand. I'm so used to it, you know. Right? And whatever that Moses was comfortable with, whatever that he was used to, God said, that is good enough for me. So we must not despise. And sometimes you realize that we, when we despise what we have, Something that is so common because we are so used to it, we fail to see the value of it. We fail to see the value of it, right? And so, as far as God is concerned, Moses said, I just have a staff, and to God itself, that staff is good enough. 
that stuff is good. Now later we will see huh, how it is. And not only that we must not despise what we have, we must also learn to be creative with what we have. Now we must be creative with what we have. If I give you an origami paper, what can you make out of it? If you have a creative mind, from the origami paper, you can actually make many, many animal shape and sizes, right? Let's look at the origami paper, what it can come up with. Right? For those people who are creative, they can imagine, they can make use. It can be the same origami paper that I give to everyone. Right? It can be the same size, it can be the same material, but based on your creativity, you can come up with many, many different forms. Correct or not? So we must be creative with what God has given to us, what is in our hand. Okay? And um, in the Bible, there was a judge. I call him a one-liner judge. Why is it I call him a one-liner judge? Because the Bible only has one verse about him. Unlike some of the judges, right? like Samson, wow, you know, chapters about Samson. We all know about him. Gideon, chapters about Gideon. But as far as this guy is concerned, just one line. I call him a one-line judge. His name is Shemgar. And Shemgar was actually a farmer. And as a farmer, he has his farming tool. And one day, God raised him up and he used his farming tool to destroy the enemy. Let's take a look at Judges chapter 3, verse 31. The Bible tells us that after Ehud came Shemgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat, he too saved Israel. It's a one-liner judge because that's all the Bible say about him. We do not know his parents. Uh, we, I mean, uh, we don't know that he's a son of Anna. Other than that, we do not know much about him. That's all we know. Uh, he's, uh, and what is an ox goat? An ox goat is not a weapon. When you go to war in the ancient day, you use spear, you use sword, right? maybe arrows and bows. Uh, these are some of the things that you use. But an ox goat, what's an ox goat? Ox goat was a very common farming tool, farming instrument that's made of wood and it's about eight feet long. It's very long, eight feet. Right? So it can be very clumsy. And it has a pointed end that uh, the plowman will use to prod the oxen. The ox will get the ox to move forward. You know? So that was a pointed end to guide the ox where they want the ox to go. But then on the other side, there's also uh, 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 something like a scrapper that, that the farmer can use to scrap off whatever dirt that's been collected right, from the plowshare. Right? Now, why did from the picture you can see, right? The first picture you can see, the farmer was having a very long rod, very long, eight feet, okay? And the shape of uh, the Osco is something like that, but they are different, different shapes and sizes. You can go and uh, uh, find out more, okay, if you want to. So why did Shemga use an Osco and not a weapon? Simply because he had no weapon. Why he got no weapon? Because at that time, the Israelites were under the oppression of the enemy. The Philistines oppressed them so much that they confiscated all their weapons because they don't want them to fight back. Right? They conquered them. They don't want them to fight back. So they confiscate all the weapons. So the whole of Israel, they got no weapon. But yet, when God raised him up, you can see that God can use common people in unconventional way to win the battle. And so therefore, instead of complaining that I don't have anything, I don't have weapon of all, I go and I can't fight the enemy, Samka simply gave what he had to the Lord. He simply used what he had in his hand to carry out God's will. Do you know how cumbersome it is to use such a long rod to fight? If fit is very long, you know, you can see, you can see all the swords, they are not that long. How are you going to fight with a long sword? It's very hard to maneuver, it's very hard to do it. But yet, you know, Shemgar didn't complain. He turned an ox goat into a weapon. Even though it may not be easy to handle, but because he was willing to surrender it to God, you realize that God used him. Right? God used him and he defeated 600 Philistines. Wow. One person fights six person. Now you can, you know, know where all the Kung Fu movies get their idea from. <laughs> Isn't it? The hero never die, Right? One person killed many people, right? So notice the end of this verse. I love it. 
the end of this verse simply say, He too saved Israel. In other words, before that, there were other judges, right? They used other things and God used them to save Israel, but He only had one ox goat, and that, what is enough is that, that He too saved Israel. That means He fulfilled the task that God has given to Him. He fulfilled the task that God had given to Him. He may not have much resources, but He used what God have given to him to save his countrymen. So don't complain that I don't have enough resources. Don't complain that I don't have enough equipment or tools. But whatever we have in our hand, we can use it. So we need to be creative and think out of the box when God wants to use you. In life, you notice that many people who are deprived, they will find a way to meet or keep up with the expectation of society. Right? If they don't have something, they will think of alternative way to meet those needs. We have learned to improvise many things in order to meet certain needs or demands. Let's take a look at the next picture. Right? For the poor, when they don't have a proper pair of slippers, what do they make use of? Have you seen this picture before? Plastic bottle, mineral water bottle. They just tie something and to them, the slipper is not branded. But it serves a function, it serves the purpose. Right? At least they can wear, they can walk about. Right? You can't say they walk about barefooted already, right? Somehow they have a slipper. Oh, or what about the, the people who can't afford to buy a tambourine right? in the rural places? Well, you think they can use a bottle cap. Right? They can improvise and can make something out of it. You see, don't say that I don't have the resources, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't play instrument. Well, still can. Whatever you can get. Nothing out of the box. And the next one, wow, it's a ukulele. And that one looks very familiar. I have it here, actually. Okay? Look very familiar, right? Some more, you use the old jeans. And then it becomes the stripe. And this one, you know, Make my own brother, brother one ho. Raise a hand, brother one ho. <laughs> but then this one is not a toy, you know. I think he took to the cell and played before, right? <laughs> Sister Yimei, are you here? Sister Yimei is supposed to be here. Yes, come, Sister Yimei. I'm going to show you that this is not a toy. She can use to play a Sunday school song too. You want to let her try? Yes, come. Pastor singer. No, 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 I don't sing. <laughs> uh, give me joy. You all know the song? Give me joy in my land. Everybody sing. Uh. Give me joy. Let's give her a hand. Wow, you see? Whatever you have in your hand, it can be used for good. I know it's trying to make advertisement for Kit Kat. Anyone of you have a Kit Kat box, you can try. <laughs> but my point is that don't complain. Don't compare ourselves with others. Don't complain that I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have resources, I don't have a few hundred branded ukulele. Doesn't matter. You still can sing. Whatever you have, use your resources. Be creative about it. And so with the shepherd stuff, something common, well, God can mix you. With an ox goat, not even a weapon. But when we are willing to surrender whatever you have in your hand to God, God can use it. So do not despise the gift that you have. Uh, be creative about it. God will use whatever we have and not what we don't have. And secondly, God will enhance the gift that we have. Whatever gift God has given to us, don't put it aside. God will enhance it. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 17, 
This is what God told Moses. Exodus 4 verse 17. He said, And take your shepherd's staff with you, and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. You see, God didn't ask Moses, go and get something better so that I can use. But God said, take your shepherd's staff, the one that you are so used to, the one that's so, you know, uh, uh, common. It may even look a little bit crude because it's not well polished. It doesn't matter. You take your shepherd's staff, not anything else, and use it to perform the miraculous sign I have shown you. God used whatever Moses has in her hand. And God said, I will use it to perform miraculous sign. Wow. What does it tell us? It tells us that God will use the ordinary to carry out the extraordinary. God will use the ordinary to carry out the extraordinary. In Exodus chapter 4, uh, in verse 3, this is what God told Moses. Now God is going to give Moses a tangible sign that to prove to him and to prove to the people that indeed God has sent him. Exodus chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4, he say, Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, Reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Now Moses' staff was turned into a snake. When God is at work, our common and ordinary gift can be used in an extraordinary way. What have God given to you? The talents, the gift. Don't look down on it. Don't think that I don't think um, I am that good. Other people are better than me. It doesn't matter. But when you are willing to allow God to use whatever thing you think is ordinary, God can turn it into extraordinary. Who would ever think a wooden staff can turn into a snake? And all things are possible with God. Uh, that is our team verse, right? Uh, this, that's our team. Uh, there to believe. Uh, and everything is possible to the one who believes. And don't think that your gifting is of not much value. Don't feel inferior. But you realize that God can enhance it. Then later, God told Moses, grab the snake by the tail. Wow, grab the snake by the tail. Isn't it dangerous? The snake can just turn back and bite you. So here God is testing Moses to see whether Moses dare to believe or not. And so in obedience, Moses stood up in faith, in courage, and he grabbed the snake by the tail and it became a rod again. So you realize that Moses passed the test. When we exercise obedience and courage, we will experience the miraculous. So now Moses personally experienced the miraculous. And he was, you know, actually it was something that, it was not something that he just watched, but something that he personally participated in. So the staff of Moses became a staff of miracle. It was not just a shepherd's staff. It became a staff of miracle. Right? With that stuff, the right, river now was turned red, and red sea was parted, and water came out from the rock, and God just used the simple shepherd stuff. Not only God will enhance the gift that we have, but God will empower us to do His work. In other words, He will give us the confidence that we need. Do we have any problem with our slide? Okay, right? God will empower us to do... Oh, we missed the first one. Okay, never mind. God will empower us to do His work. In other words, He will give us the confidence that we need. Now, we all know the story of Moses, a uh, story of David and Goliath. And how David just used his sling and the stone to kill a giant. Alright? So, it's a story that we are very familiar with. Uh, you realize that David did not use anybody's gift. David did not use any other weapon. But David used whatever that belonged to him, his own, his sling. All right? His sling and his stone that he picked from the river. And moreover, you realize that David, even though Saul wanted to offer him the armor, he couldn't make use of Saul's armor. He just made you whatever he had. And then with the one, one sling, he killed Goliath. Now, you realize that Saul's armor, when it put on David, it was just too clumsy for David. Can I have the next slide, please? 
right? And it was too big for David, and David couldn't make use of Saul's armor. And what did he do? He said, I will just go without any armor. I just go with my plain clothes. Whereas on the other hand, you realize that Goliath, not only he was big, Goliath was also fully armored. The Bible described Goliath not only fully armored, even his face was all shielded except the nose there, in between the forehead, in between the two eyes. That was the only part of his body that's been exposed. The rest are fully armored. But yet, he left one spot. Uh, one spot that is not covered. It became the weak spot. It became a loophole. And David went to fight with his ordinary clothing, with no armor, with no protection. But he just killed Goliath with one stone. It was so accurate. It just hit in between his eye. Not any part that was being armored, but just the only part, the only loophole. And David was able to kill Goliath with that one stone. No doubt a sling can be dangerous. Some people think that, no, David's sling is just a toy. Actually, it's not a toy. David used a sling to chase the animal. Even in ancient warfare, sometimes they do use the sling. So the sling can also be used as a weapon. It can be a dangerous weapon. All right? And in fact, based on some research and calculation, it is possible for a slingshot to kill Goliath. Based on the weight of the stone, based on the velocity, the speed, and so on and so forth. But I don't think David did any calculation at the time. I don't think he attended physical class and do all the calculation of how, which angle I should shoot and all that. No, David just trusted the Lord because he said, you came with me, you know, with sword and spear, but I come to you with the name of the Lord. And he trusted the Lord. All right, so the accuracy, the speed and all that must be enhanced by the Holy Spirit, the accuracy and so on and so forth. And so David was able to kill Goliath with one stone because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gave him the confidence. So when we dare to believe God, the so small, small gift, many times we say that I have small gift only. La. Right? I only have a little bit of gift only. But you know that God can multiply and expand its effectiveness, whatever small you think your gift may be. The small little stone can kill a big giant. Whatever gift it is, when it's in your hand, you surrender it to God, God will use it and it will enhance its effectiveness. Just like a small boy. He doesn't have much. He only has a lunchbox, five loaves and two fish. That's all he had in his hand. But when he's willing to offer it to Jesus, it was able to feed 5,000 people and left over 12 baskets. You realize that we must be good steward of the gift that God has given to us. The more we use our gift, the more God will multiply it. Otherwise, what we have, we may even lose it. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told of the parable of the talents. And I'm sure we are familiar with these talents. He talked about how a master went away and uh, for far away land. And before he went off, he called his three servants and gave them different talents. Right? So in the modern translation, they call them the bags of silver. One, he gave five bags of silver. The second one, he gave two bags of silver. And the last one, one bag. And when the master returned, he wanted to see whether you know, they have made full use of the bag of silver. And we know the first one had multiplied it, double four, he got ten bags. And the second one multiplied it, he got four bags. Back, you know? and then, but then the last one, what happened? He said, I didn't do anything. I buried it. And the master was very angry. And let's take a look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 28. And this is what the master said. Right? Matthew chapter 25, verse 28. Then he ordered, take the money from his servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And I want to emphasize on this verse 29. It says, to those who use well what they are given, if you use well the gift that God has given to you, 
even more will be given. God will multiply it. But from those who do nothing, if God gives you a gift, a talent, and you don't do anything about it, whatever little you have will be taken away. Just like the man with the one bag of silver. In the end, the master took it away from him and gave it to the one who already have ten bags because he's faithful. He's faithful. He's a faithful steward. And so, church, I want to encourage all of us. When sometimes when we want to sit back and relax, we say we don't want to do anything. But do you know that whatever God has given you, you don't use it, it will be taken away. But when we are willing to use it, God will enhance it. It will multiply it. It will multiply its effectiveness. It can become a blessing to many people. All right? And finally, God does not want to entertain excuses. God does not want to entertain excuses. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 14, it tells us that God was angry with Moses. All right? Now, in verse 13, but Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send someone else. This is after God has shown him all the signs right, that the, the staff turned into snake, and then his hand you know, became leprous and then whole again. And God has already shown him all these signs, but he still do not want to go. He said, please send someone else. Verse 14, then the Lord became angry with Moses. Wow. Do you like it when God becomes angry with you? No. no, right? We want God to love us. So this is one time in the Bible that is mentioned that God was angry not with a group of people but with a particular individual. And that individual actually is his own child, right? Moses. God called him. But when Moses gave all the lame excuses, God was angry. Now for every excuse that Moses gave, God has already provided an answer there was actually no more good reason why Moses should not go to Egypt. And there was no more good reason that Moses can come up with. So Moses actually didn't give any more reason. Moses simply said, God, send someone else. He got no more reason, but he just said, God, send someone else. That God was angry with Moses when he tried to change God's mind one last time. And then now God said, I will even provide you with a helper, his own brother Aaron. So what more could Moses say? Moses got no more excuses, so right? he obeyed the law. So the end, we all know, you know, the rest is history. Now, God was not upset with Moses when Moses wanted to know his name. He said, God, when people ask, what is the name of God who called you? What am I going to say? And God wrote to Moses, I am. God was not angry with that in order to persuade the leaders. God was not upset when Moses needed something tangible to prove to the Israelites that God has indeed appeared to him. So God asked him to use his stuff and turn it into a snake. But God was upset when Moses tried to evade responsibility and disobey his command. That was what made God angry. Why? Because by refusing to respond to God, Moses was actually doubting the ability of God to do what he said he would do. Why was Moses still the one to go? Maybe he said, God, now you show me all this miracle, you know, because it's only between you and me. But in front of all these people, can or not? Huh? Maybe he was still doubting, right? And he was unwilling to make sacrifices knowing that it wouldn't be easy. Now Moses was a married man. He got a wife, he got children. He got a father, in know too. And Moses know that it was not going to be so easy. I just go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said, okay, no problem, go. He knows it's not going to be easy. And he knows that Israelite is not just one or two family. Uh, there are so many of them. It's not going to be easy. And therefore, Moses was not willing to make sacrifice, actually. That's why he didn't want to go in the first place. And then Moses was also afraid of rejection. Rejection by who? Rejection by his own people. Because he remember way back, Right, when he was still in Egypt, when he was still young and ambitious, he helped you know, uh, 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 the Jewish people, he killed an Egyptian. But when the Jews found out, they actually rejected him. They said, who do you think you are? You know, who made you a judge between us? They rejected him. And so Moses was afraid. You see, all the background history somehow has given Moses that fear, the fear of rejection. I see he was rejected 40 years ago by them. He was afraid he would be rejected again. But at the end of the day, there was no more excuses, and Moses went. And church, I want you to know there's no excuse we can give before God because he has already equipped and empowered us for the task. No more excuses, right? So another person that we can know of is Gideon. 
We all know that God called Gideon too. And at first, Gideon also tried to, you know, give some excuses on why he cannot save the Israelites. This is the time of judges. They were under the oppression of the Midianite. And God appeared to uh, Gideon and asked Gideon to rescue the people. Judges chapter 6, verse 15. Let's see what Gideon said to the Lord. What kind of excuse, right? Judges chapter 6, verse 15. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. He said, My clan is the weakest. I am the least. Very familiar, right? We say that, no, la, no, I'm very weak. You know, I don't come from a big family. I don't come from you know, a, 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 a well-to-do family. I, I don't have much. But God already know all this before he called Gideon. You think God don't know? God already know all this before he, he, he called Gideon. And so to encourage Gideon, you notice that God has already given him encouragement before this. Right, let's take a look how God encouraged Gideon. In verse 6, 12, Right, the next page, you realize that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and called him what? Mighty hero or mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. Right? And then in verse 14, he said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from Midian. I am sending you. Now, you see, before God called Gideon, God already knew that Gideon would give this kind of excuses. So therefore, when he called him, he already addressed him as mighty hero because Gideon said, I am weak. I am the least. But God said, you are a mighty hero. Why? Why is he a mighty hero? The next line. The Lord is with you. You are a hero not because of you yourself, but because I am with you. I will make you a hero. And secondly, he said that, you know, I am the least. Right? My clan so because I'm the least. And what did the Lord say? Go with the strength you have. Go with the strength you have. What strength does he have? He's already small. Right? Go with the strength. What kind of strength? Physically, I don't think Gideon was a strong man. He's just a normal human being, normal guy. He, was not, he doesn't have the strength of Samson. All right? And I believe that Gideon was also weak mentally, emotionally, because he thinks that my clan is a, the weakest. I am the least. Already he had that inferiority complex. Already he already, he already looking down upon himself. Right? So what strength does he have? He don't have the strength. But yet God said, go with the strength you have. In other words, no matter how small you think that your strength is, as far as Gideon is concerned, he doesn't have much strength. But God said, go with the strength you have. And then, what did God say? I am sending you. Even though you think your strength is a little, but because I am, strength, I am the one that's sending you, you are going to be strong. So focus on what God say. I am with you. I am sending you. So before we think of making any excuses, just remember, God is the one that call. God is the one that go with us. God is the one that's sending us. And again, because of that, right? God used Gideon, and Gideon was able to rescue the Israelite from the Midianites. We need to put aside our inferiority complex. We need to put aside the small mindset. When God gives us a gift, He has a task in mind for us. And when God gives us a task, He will multiply the gift He has given to us if we, are, if we obey Him. In every excuse we give, remember God has an answer. So what excuse do you have? You think, I am too young. God used the lunch of a small boy. In fact, God used a small little servant girl. The servant girl that was captured by Naaman and God used a servant girl. It was through her that Naaman went to Israel to ask for the prophet and he was killed. If you think that I'm too old, Moses was caught at the age of 80. Caleb went to conquer the mountain at the age of 85. You think I'm too weak and scared? God used Gideon. He was hiding. He was treasuring wheat at the wine press. He said, I'm small, I'm weak. And God used Gideon. You think I'm the youngest, I'm the least. God used David. He was young. He was a teenager. He was the youngest. He was the least. He was the shepherd boy. You think I'm not smart? Remember, God even used a donkey. I'm sure you're better than a donkey. Don't you? Yeah. Are you better than donkey? Yeah. Yes. We are better than donkey. Therefore, God can use us. 
So God is calling all of us to serve Him. We must step in by faith. We must dare to believe God uh, because God is with us and He's sending us. All of us must serve Him, the young and the old, male or female, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. God has no respect of person and God will want to use everyone. Don't look at your lack and inadequacy. Remember, God will use what you have in your hand. He doesn't demand something that you cannot do or something that you do not have. When He calls, He equips. Don't despise the gift that you have. God will enhance it. He will multiply it so that you will know it is God that works through you and not yourself. Don't give any more excuses. Why? Because you will never win an argument with God. You'll never win an argument with God. Trust me, you will always lose. So don't give any more excuses. What do you have in your hand today? What do you have? I'm sure each and every one of you have received a gift from the Lord. Use it for His glory. To those of you who are senior citizens, you are retired. Your, your days is not over yet. Yeah, your day is not over yet. God still can use you. Don't always think that, oh, I am now old, you know, I can't do much. Well, you can't do much, at least do little. Still do something, isn't it? Right? Do whatever you are able to do. It is better than you do nothing. And of course, the common excuse of the senior citizen is, let the young people do it. Am I right? My time is over. La. Let the young people do it. Hey, we don't have that many young people also. But if all the young people, what are you going to do? I'm sure you don't want to rot. <laughs> don't sit there and rot. Go and do something. All right? In fact, when the young people see you continue to serve the Lord, they get encouraged. They get motivated to serve. You know why? Hey, yo, look at that uncle. Ah. So old already. I still can serve, you know. Uh, yeah, I better step up, you know. Ah, look at the auntie, you know. Walk also cannot walk straight, but then she's still serving, you know. They get encouraged. So senior citizen, don't think that you retire already, don't need to do anything. Right? God can use you. Moses was 80 years old, Caleb was 85. You have not reached the age yet, you can't retire, okay? To the youth and the young adults, it's a beginning. Don't say that, I'm too small, la. I don't have experience, la, you know. I, I, I don't think I can do much, I'm the least. God can use Gideon, God can use David, and God can use you. To the rest of you, uh, the middle adult, the young adult, you are at your prime. Uh, give your best to serve the Lord at the prime of your life. I know you have your career, you have your family, you have young children. Put God first and He will take care of your family. Moses has the family too. All right? And so are the rest of the many people in the Bible you read. They have their family too. The disciples, they have their family too. They have their children too. But because they're there to trust the Lord. Right? They're there to serve God and God use them greatly. So today, stop all your excuses and start serving. All right? Next slide, uh, if you have not yet get involved, you can actually scan this QR code and start responding and say, yes, Lord, I want to serve. Perhaps you say, what well, if I scan? How do I know what area to serve? Uh, don't worry. You scan, you see all the area for you to choose. And don't worry about whether you are capable or not. Remember, God will use what you have in your hand. Don't despise the little that you have. God will multiply it. Amen? Um, let's pray, shall we? Can I have the worship team to come up? For those of you that have been serving faithfully, keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. When God used David, he not only killed Goliath, eventually he became the king of Israel. And he went on serving and became king for the next 40 years. And therefore, it's an encouragement for us to continue to serve the Lord. As long as you have breath, as long as you still have strength in you, use it to serve God. And for those of you who are not involved, perhaps you think that you are not ready. Well, Moses thought he was not ready. 
but God called him. Gideon thought he was not ready. God called him. Many people in the past never thought they were ready, but God called them. So I want you to know that God will equip you when you are willing to offer what you have to the Lord. God does not demand from you what you do not have. God will use what you already have and He will make it better. So I trust that all of us will begin to respond to the Lord and say, Yes, Lord. I want to be used by you. I want you to empower me. The gift that I offer to you, ask of you to expand it. And for those of you who are faithfully serving, maybe you feel that you are not good enough. Well, whatever you do, you are not here to try to meet people's expectations. You just need to be faithful to God. You will never meet people's expectations because when you meet one expectation, there will be another expectation coming up. So when you serve, please don't think of meeting the expectation of people. Just be faithful to God. Moses never met the expectation of the Israelites. They murmur and they complain so much because he never met up to their expectation. But Moses was God's chosen one. And we all know Moses was a great man. He was not there to meet the expectation of men, but he was there to obey and to carry out the will of God.